I don't know about you, but I found out that there's a war against Christmas going on right now. And it's rather staggering. It's being launched by these long leith leotard clad ballet dancers. Because with COVID, all their venues for live performances have been closed down. So they're going online and they're squeezing the airspace out of channels like mine that focus on biblical interpretation. We just can't tolerate this any longer. So remember, friends don't let friends watch virtual ballet. Good morning. This is the Sunday after Christmas, before Epiphany starts. And the readings for this Sunday really focus on the fulfillment of the dreams and hopes and aspirations of ancient Israel and the people of God as a whole. Our reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40, really focuses in on two individuals, Simeon and Anna, who are two elderly people who have spent most of their adult life devoutly serving God within the temple. And Luke zeroes in on their experience of meeting the new baby of Christ to show how these hopes and aspirations are fulfilled with the birth of Jesus. Now this passage is loaded with all kinds of allusions and quotations and references to the Old Testament. And I really want to keep this video short this week. And for the sake of time, I'm going to do more of a devotional type study in this video. Now, right before this passage opens, in chapter 2, verse 21, we're told that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. And this is important because now when we go into Mary and Joseph taking Jesus into the temple, they're going to fulfill two other religious obligations, the ritual of purity for Mary, and then also the redemption of the firstborn for Jesus. These three practices, circumcision, the purification ritual, and then the redemption of the firstborn, all show that Jesus' family was very religiously observant and they followed the practices of Israel during their day in accordance with the Old Testament prescriptions. So from the very start of Jesus' life as a baby, we can see that his life was lived in accordance with the Old Testament principles and the Jewish religion. It came time for the purification according to the law of Moses. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn man shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered him as a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. In verses 22 through 24, Luke summarizes and combines their observance of two Jewish rituals. The first one was the purification that Mary had to undergo after giving birth to a baby boy. And the second one was the redemption of Jesus as the firstborn male of their family, according to the Old Testament law. And he really doesn't differentiate between the two here. In fact, he kind of mixes them together. And his point isn't to give you a detailed account, but just give you a summary in two verses of the observance of Jesus' family to the Old Testament laws. In particular, the book of Leviticus in chapter 12 talks about how a woman should undergo a ritual of purification after giving birth to a male son. This is then combined with the ritual of the redemption of the firstborn son of Israel. In other words, every firstborn male of the household of Israel was claimed by God. And then the family needed to make a sacrifice in order to redeem that son back for the family. And this is what the Holy Family is doing here. They are going to the temple, and Luke is going to combine these two rituals into one for us to see what's taking place. The fact that Luke mentions that they present two turtle doves shows us two things. First off, they are making a sacrifice to the Lord for Mary's purification. And this would be done, they would take these two turtle doves, Mary would lay her hands upon them, and then the priest would take them from the court of the women into the inner court, place them upon the altar. He would wring the neck of one bird, place it on the altar, and then the other bird he would kill and then place upon the altar as a burnt offering unto the Lord. So we see right from the very start of Jesus' life that his family is very religiously observant, 
But the second thing we learn is that they're a very poor family as well. After this, notice how much space Luke gives to the encounter with Simeon and Anna. His reference to A, Jesus being circumcised and then the fulfillment of the purification law and then the redemption of the firstborn only takes up three or four verses. But now from verse 25 to 40, we have 15 verses where Luke focuses upon two individuals, Simeon and then Anna. So let's take a look at Simeon's encounter with the baby Jesus, starting in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Before we go into detail about Simeon and Anna's story, is that the temple courts would have been bustling with a lot of people. It's a lot like going into a bustling shopping area. Joseph and Mary take their newborn baby Jesus, probably about 40 days old, into the temple courts, and there would have been a lot of people there. But by focusing on just Simeon and Anna, you get the impression that this is a very private encounter. It gives an intimacy to the story that you would not have if he had focused upon the crowds. All right, where were we? Back to Simeon's account here. When we meet Simeon and also Anna, we definitely get the impression that these are very elderly people. Simeon has been promised by God that he would not see death until he saw the birth of the Messiah. And also when he says, now you can dismiss me, that you really see that Simeon is at the end of his life. And he has been hoping and waiting since that message has been given to him to see the birth of the Messiah. He has lived in a state of hope and expectation for this day when he would actually see the Lord's appointed one. And you can imagine after seeing the baby Jesus, he would have been walking on air for the rest of that day. Now, when Simeon sees the baby Jesus, he utters what is called the Nunc Dimittis. And this is taken from the Latin translation, which starts off Nunc Dimittis Servum Tum, Domini Secundum Verbum Tum in Pace. In other words, Nunc Dimittis, now you may dismiss your servant, Lord. When Simeon utters this nunc dimittis, it's a collection of quotes and ideas out of the book of Isaiah. And basically what he is saying there in this blessing or this hymn over Jesus is that Jesus' life and mission will be according to the model of Isaiah's suffering servant. His blessing or hymn there that he utters over the baby Jesus really reflects the hopes and the aspirations of Israel. And for him personally, the Nuke Dimittis really expresses this idea that he has gotten some very, very good news and now he can go on his way. God's word has been fulfilled. Now it would be great if it ended there, but he makes two sort of oracle type statements. The first one is the Nuke Dimittis, the sort of blessing or hymn. And the second one is a word that he gives personally to Mary. Now imagine you're this little family. You've just had your first child born. He's about 40 days old and you're in the temple in the middle of all these people. This must have been a very, very joyous and, and special occasion in their life. And then right in the middle of this, this old guy comes up, takes your baby in his arms and utters this incredible blessing upon his life. And then he turns to you and he gives this rather oracle-like statement regarding your relationship with the child as he grows older. 
The first thing he says is that this child is appointed for the rise and the fall of many. His statement here really echoes Mary's Magnificat in chapter 1, starting with verse 36. And in that, she says that the Lord has pulled down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has met the needs of those who are hungry, but the rich he has sent away. In the same way, there's an overthrowing and an upheaval of social values here as well. In a similar way, when Simeon says that this child is destined to be the rising and the fall of many, it's reflecting this idea of the reversal of social expectations and values that occurs within Jesus' life, death, and ministry. But he gets a lot more personal than that. He turns to Mary and he says that he will be a sword that will pierce your heart. Now imagine, you're a young mother, you've had a baby now for what, six weeks? And you've got this old guy saying that this child here is going to be a sword that will pierce your heart. The price that Mary is going to pay, not only in the birth of Jesus, but also them raising him and then watching him die upon the cross, is rather staggering. And it's one of these things that the Protestant churches really don't give enough emphasis to and could learn something from our Roman Catholic brothers regarding the role of Mary in salvation. Imagine being a young family and then having somebody make this phenomenal sort of blessing him over your child, but then turning to you and uttering this oracle that tells you about the price you're going to have to pay in raising and watching your child grow. Then we meet Anna. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now notice how Luke is balancing a male and a female figure here. If we go back to chapter 1, we have the appearance of the angel to Zechariah in the temple, and then the second appearance is to Mary. The same thing here. First we have Simeon, and then we have Anna. And Luke does this back and forth throughout his gospel, and we also see some parallels with that within the book of Acts as well. Now we're told a couple things about Anna, just like with Simeon, she's advanced in age as well. She's probably close to 100 years old because she lived with her husband for seven years, and now she's 84 years old. Also, you need to take into account that she was maybe 15 to 20 years old when she got married. So she's anywhere between, let's say, 95 to 105 years old, a very elderly lady within the temple. She is incredibly devout. And finally, we are told this very interesting thing, that she is from the household of Phineal, from the tribe of Asher. So why does Luke give us this very obscure little reference here about Anna, when he didn't tell us that about Simeon? Asher was one of the 10 tribes of northern Israel that got carried off in 722 with the Assyrian invasion. Only a remnant of the people stayed behind, and Asher was sort of west and north of the Sea of Galilee along the Mediterranean coast, an area during the time of the New Testament that was really not part of Israel. So she may represent, A, the hopes and aspirations of northern Israel that got carried away during the Syrian invasion, that God is going to fulfill these promises not only to Judah, but also to the 10 northern tribes, or she might represent someone who's from sort of a Samaritan type region. She is Jewish, but lives within a Gentile culture. In either case, I think Luke is mentioning her background to help us to see that these promises and the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament are not just to the people of Israel, if he had just focused with Simeon, but it is much wider. It's going out to the Gentiles as well. And just like Simeon, she is she represents someone who has had great expectations and hope within her life, and it is fulfilled when she sees the baby Jesus. I think what Phillips Brooks wrote in 1868 in the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, really sums up the message of today's readings very, very well, much better than I ever could. 
O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight, I think really summarizes the experience of Simeon and Anna in the temple, and then gives Mary and Joseph a great deal to think about as they walk out of the temple regarding their son's life and upbringing. Until next week, I hope your celebration and observance of Christmas has really been a time where you could focus upon how the hopes and fears of all the years were met in Christ that night. Peace.